Hello and welcome to Firearm Freedom. This is going to be another Millsurp Monday video. And before we get this Millsurp Monday video started, I just wanted to let you guys know that we do have a Firearm Freedom merchandise store live. The link for that is down in the description below. Anything you purchase from that merchandise store greatly supports what we do here on Firearm Freedom. Also, while you're down there, if you enjoy the content that's coming out here on the channel, hit that subscribe button and ring that bell. It really helps us out. This is going to be another one of those Millsurp Monday videos that has me shaking with excitement to finally get this rifle here on the channel. The rifle that we're going to be talking about today is this awesome, almost immaculate, M1 carbine. And I'm proud to say that this is an all original M1 carbine. I'm going to actually be doing another video in a couple of days here for really anybody that wants to nerd out on some M1 carbine markings. And we're going to be going into this gun super in depth, taking every piece apart. And I'm going to show you guys the letter codes on each one of those pieces. I figured that not everybody would actually want to see that. So I'm going to do a separate video just including that. But in today's video, I'm going to show you guys just the stock receiver and barrel. So one of the first things that people look at on M1 carbines for manufacturers is generally on the receiver. Now this one has a slightly later adjustable rear sight and because of that the manufacturer's marking is actually underneath the rear sight and it's a little bit difficult to see. This receiver is actually a quality hardware receiver, which is extremely exciting because those are slightly harder to find than your typical inland or Winchester receivers. And then the barrel is a Buffalo Arms barrel dated September of 1943. And I have to say the rifling on this barrel is absolutely phenomenal. On top of that, what is even cooler about this M1 carbine is the original Rockola stock that this is sporting. Those of you guys out there that are familiar with US military surplus rifles will know that Rockola otherwise known as the jukebox company back in the 40s that made stocks for World War II era US service rifles always made some of the highest quality stocks. Rockola also made complete rifles as well, or I should say somewhat complete rifles because most of the time, for an M1 carbine, people get a little bit confused and they see a rifle with multiple manufacturers and think it is just a parts gun. When in reality, M1 carbines were really contracted out to major manufacturing companies and then smaller companies that did not produce firearms before the war. And that is why a lot of the time you will see barrels made by certain manufacturers and receivers made by others along with stocks. Now, in order to see where the Rockola stamp is on this stock, it's very easy to miss. And if you are looking at an M1 carbine at a gun shop, where you're gonna wanna look is actually right on the opposite side where your sling and oiler is. Now it's gonna be relatively difficult to pick up on camera here, but you will notice an RMC cartouche right in the grain of the wood there. And that is the proper cartouche for Rockola stocks. I did quite a bit of research into this and it actually all checks out. It's very exciting because this rifle does not have any import markings whatsoever. Now, quality hardware did not make barrels for the receivers. After doing a lot of research, I realized that they did make a lot of receivers, but they actually contracted Buffalo Arms among a couple of other companies to do their barrels. So it actually would check out that a quality hardware receiver M1 carbine would have a Buffalo Arms barrel. On top of that, another really interesting point is that quality hardware did not make their own stocks either. So when you have a quality hardware M1 carbine, you can expect it to have a Rockola stock. And there's one main reason for that. The Rockola manufacturing plant was actually right down the street from the quality hardware manufacturing plant. So again, it would make sense that this stock would be on a quality hardware receiver. Now, a lot of the times, if you're at a gun show, you really, really wanna know what you're looking at when it comes to an M1 carbine, because just as easily as you could get a great price on an M1 carbine, if somebody doesn't understand what they have, 
or thinks it is a parts gun, you can very easily get tricked into thinking it's an original example when in reality it is not. So it's very important that you get on the forums and understand what each letter code means and what all the parts coming together should be and what they should not be. And I would imagine that with the barrel date of 1943 and the other numbers checking out to around the same time in the early 40s, that this rifle absolutely saw some service overseas during World War II, which is just incredible. The amount of soul that this rifle has is really awesome, and just holding it, maneuvering it around at the range was really an amazing experience for me, and I'm so happy to finally get one of these rifles in the collection. You guys will notice a sling and a magazine pouch here on the rifle. These did not come with the rifle, unfortunately. I sourced them from Liberty Tree Collectors, and these are original period correct items. So these are all around the early 40s, and this would have been the proper sling, original oiler, and the original magazine pouch here on the side. These magazine pouches are pretty awesome. Unfortunately, I only have one magazine at the moment for this guy. I will soon be getting more magazines, and I'm very, very excited because I'll finally be able to fill this magazine pouch on the stock and not have it just empty. This quality hardware M1 carbine does also have a bayonet lug up here at the front. I was seeing some mixed information about how some versions of the M1 carbine should have that, whereas others should not. Now we can get into how the rifle shot. Guys, <laughs> this is one pretty awesome rifle. We ended up shooting some brass case and some steel case ammunition. I know many of you military surplus collectors just kind of scoffed at the fact that I shot steel case Tula ammo through an original M1 carbine. But after scouring the forums and seeing a couple other videos on YouTube, I actually found out that people were having better luck with steel case ammunition for reliability in original carbines than they were with brass case ammunition. I can't say that that would be the exact same with my example. I did have a couple of malfunctions. I think we totaled around two malfunctions. One, I had a case expand in the chamber and it did not want to extract. I had to give it one more rack of the op rod and then it extracted out just fine. And then I also had a failure to feed. Now that failure to feed could have been caused by the magazine, and unfortunately, I only had one magazine at that range day, so I can't say for certain that it was the ammo or the magazine, but I can tell you that other than that, this gun shot all of the ammunition, steel case, and brass without any hiccups whatsoever. It was a very, very reliable gun overall, and I know there's many, many accounts of people saying the M1 carbine is less reliable than other options out there, and they're really not great guns. I can tell you guys that was absolutely not the case with this example. I think a lot of the time people get modern representations of the M1 carbines and generally those do have a ton of issues. I don't quite know what it is, but with the M1 carbine, it is most definitely one of those situations where they don't make these guns like they used to. A lot of the original guns are phenomenal and they rarely do have issues from what I've seen. One interesting thing that I was noticing that nobody else could really pinpoint either was the fact that I had empty cartridges ejecting directly back and nailing my forehead whenever we were shooting the steel cased ammunition. Now this did happen with brass cased ammo as well. It was just not as dramatic. With the steel cased ammunition, it was really nailing backwards pretty freaking hard to the point that it actually chipped the side of my GoPro lens with empty steel casings. Maybe my ejector or my extractor needs to be swapped out or tuned properly. But to be honest with you guys, I've never really seen that before. So if you guys are familiar with what would be causing that issue, definitely hit up down in the comment section below and let me know what you think. That'd be super helpful. This was actually the first time that I ever got my hands on an M1 carbine to shoot. I've only handled ones before this. And I can tell you guys, I was blown away with how low this gun recoils and how easy it is to maneuver around the range. It's so lightweight and actually a pretty stout cartridge. A lot of people think 30 carbine is a crappy round overall, but honestly, it's ballistically comparable to 357 Magnum, especially out of a longer barrel like this. It is no slouch of a cartridge by any means. And mixing that and the overall shootability, it was just phenomenal. Another question that I got a lot from many of you guys watching was how expensive 30 carbine ammo was. I can definitely tell you guys, if you go into a regular gun shop and just are looking for 30 carbine ammo, 
it's going to be pretty expensive. A lot of the time you can look at even 30 plus dollars for a box of 50, but I promise you guys, if you go online, you can generally find it even as low as like $14 a box. Now with everything going on, with all of the issues right now and ammunition shortages. I can't tell you guys if that's going to stay the same or is gonna be the same even a week from now. Overall, guys, that is pretty much going to wrap up this video. There's not much to say about this rifle other than positive things. It has so much soul and I'm so happy to finally complete what I like to call the trifecta of cool US military surplus rifles, which is my M1A, my M1 Garand, and now my M1 Carbine. I feel like no set is complete in a US military surplus collection without an M1 carbine. And prices are continuing to skyrocket on these M1 carbines. So if you can get a hold of one, I would definitely do it sooner rather than later. But if you guys do have any other questions or anything like that, definitely throw them down below in the comment section. While you're down there, check out the links in the description to the Firearm Freedom Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram account. We do daily posts on all three of those accounts that you guys are definitely not going to want to miss. And as always, stay tuned for more great content to come soon.